What's up, everybody? Back with another Bible study. Uh, back here in the book of Habakkuk. And we're here in Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3. It's the last chapter in Habakkuk. Habakkuk, Habakkuk is only three chapters. And uh, we're just finishing up. You see the sun is starting to get dark out here. Just finishing up the 73rd birthday of Israel. Israel turns 73 today. And there's not much time left. There's not much time left. Uh, whether we have another year or whether it's this year. I don't think it's beyond that. Although it could be. could be. But... A lot of stuff's happening. We see what's happening in Israel. Uh, last I heard, there were reports that Israel and Jordan's military, their armies were shooting at each other. And there were thousands of people rushing over from Jordan that want to participate in this Um uh, these protests against Israel. We're three days away from Pentecost on the Hebrew calendar. And um, there's just not much time left. Sorry, I was waiting for these people to pass me. Some, some people came out of nowhere. Walking, walking behind my car. But, uh... We gotta be ready. We gotta be ready, uh... You know, Jesus said he's gonna come as a, as a thief in the night. And, uh... Could be any time. Like I've said before, from my under, my understanding, I mean, I could have this wrong, but from my understanding, there's uh, the seals open over a period of about 10 days. That's when the captivity, spoken in Revelation chapter 2, happens, that 10-day captivity. And I believe at the end of the 10 days, that's when the sixth seal happens, that's when the Gog-Magog war happens, that's when Babylon is destroyed, that's when everything happens. That's when he comes on the clouds. But uh, I believe the 144,000 are caught up at the beginning of that time. And, you know, we don't know when, when it's all going to happen. We don't know when it's all going to break out. It could be another year. It could be this year. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. Uh, we don't know. But let's get into Habakkuk. And before we, before we get started, let me go ahead and preach the gospel. Everyone is going to stand before God for judgment one day. Anyone who hasn't received forgiveness of sins, anyone who hasn't received the free gift of salvation, is going to be judged and thrown into the lake of fire. And we're going to see, I just wanted to say this as well, uh, we're going to see G Jesus coming on the clouds. What, ha what happens when he comes on the clouds here in Habakkuk chapter 3. But uh, this first death, it's just the body. It's just the death of the body. Our soul doesn't die. But the second death in a lake of fire, that's the death of body and soul. God requires perfection in order to inherit eternal life, in order to be with Him in His kingdom. None of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do to earn a right standing with God. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. And God... God's kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, and he's not going to allow any sin or sinner or unrighteousness in his kingdom. We have to be made perfect. And the only one to ever live a perfect life was Jesus. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, born as a human, faced temptations like us, but lived a perfect life. And although he was perfect and didn't deserve to die, he didn't deserve any punishment, he died for us. That death that we deserve in a lake of fire for our sins, he died for us on the cross. 
So through him, our death is taken away and we receive his perfection, his righteousness. Through him, our sin is taken away and we receive, well, through him, that death is taken away, we, we receive eternal life. Through him, our sin is taken away. Through his sacrifice, our sin is taken away. And we receive his righteousness, his perfection that he lived out. It's only through faith in Jesus and what he did for us that we can be saved. Repent and believe the gospel. The word repent means to have a change of heart or a change of mind. It means to truly give your life to God. Most of the time we see repent in the Bible, it means to turn from your sins and turn to God. Turn from your sins turn and turn to God, follow him, do what's right. Repent and believe the gospel. If you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose three days later, and you call out to him to forgive you, to save you, and you truly mean it, he will forgive you. He'll give you the Holy Spirit, which changes your heart and leads you to follow him. The Holy Spirit also gives you wisdom, discernment, and understanding in the Bible and in many things. He'll forgive you. He'll, he'll give you the Holy Spirit, and he'll give you eternal life. The Bible says we can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even imagine it. We know it's going to be with the Father, with the Son, with the angels, with the rest of the people of God in his kingdom, in paradise, for eternity, in new glorified bodies that don't die. Not these bodies that do, but new bodies that don't die. Repent and believe the gospel. Give your life to Jesus Christ today. There's truly not much time left. Now let's get into Habakkuk 3. Uh final chapter in the book of the prophet Habakkuk. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shagayanoth. And in the footnote for Shagayanoth just says, a highly emotional poetic form. I was thinking it was a person or something. <laughs> a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shagayanoth. Yahuwah, I have heard the report about you and I fear. And we hear the report about him as well. Through, through the scriptures, through all these prophecies, through his word that tells us about him. And about what he's going to do here in these last days. And we need to fear as well. We need to re reverence him, respect him, but fear him as well. We need to fear his judgment, his punishment. Everyone's going to be judged based on what they do. And that should put a fear into us. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yahuwah, I have heard the report about you and I fear. O oh, Yahuwah, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. And it's interesting that it mentions it twice. I'm not sure if there's a... I'm not sure what it means exactly. In wrath, remember mercy. It says, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So, revive your work in the midst of the years. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this part. The actual, the meaning of this, uh, prophetically. God comes from Teman. And the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. So this is speaking about when Jesus comes on the clouds. And so Teman was in uh, Edom. We read here. Well, we just have to. Uh, I'll just read Ezekiel 25, verse 13 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it, and I will lay it waste, 
from Teman even to Dita, and they will fall by the sword and uh, eat them. Uh, well, it can represent modern day Jordan, but Edom it ha has a fulfillment in the United States. Edom is Esau, brother to Jacob, Israel. And we know the U.S. is like brother nations with uh, Israel. That's not the only reason I'm saying this, but that's just uh, another thing that confirms it. So Teman is speaking about Edom. And also Mount Paran we read here. Let's see. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to Start the car here in a minute. My phone's about to die. I didn't realize it was so low. Mount Paran. I don't know if I have anything looked up concerning that. Oh, yeah. Mount Paran here. And we're also going to go to Deuteronomy 33 as well. But Genesis 14 verse 6 says, The Horites in their Mount Seir... Well, Mount Paran is also uh, we we see from what it says here in Habakkuk. You're speaking about the same place from Edom, and if we go here to, like I said, we're going to go to Deuteronomy here in a second, but we go to Isaiah 63. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? And we're going to read here in a second why he's coming from Edom. Well, he's coming for salvation, but also for judgment, just like when, when he comes, I mean, just the same as when he comes for the whole world. Uh, but he's coming from, from Edom, according to this. Which, you know, it's interesting because Jesus said from when he comes, it'll be like from east to west. And Edom is west of, uh, or east of Jerusalem. But, but this here, like, like I've said, these uh, prophecies of Edom is spoken, speaking about the U.S. From my understanding. Who is this who comes from Edom? With garments of glowing colors from Basra. This one who is majestic in his apparel. Marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like one who treads the winepress. I have trodden the wine trough alone. And from the peoples there is no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. The grapes, the grape harvest, the grapes from Revelation 14. And their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption has come. From Edom. Coming from Edom. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. 
And just to go over to Deuteronomy 33 real quick. Deuteronomy 33 gives us a picture of what happens when Jesus comes on the clouds. He's going to be with the 144,000. And this we see in other scriptures. And we're also going to see it uh, later here in Habakkuk as well, I believe. But Deuteronomy 33. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel before his death. He said, Yahuwah came from Sinai. This is speaking about the heavenly Sinai. His kingdom. And dawned on them from Seir. Seir is Edom. Mount Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. And he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. This is speaking about the 144,000. And uh, Enoch also let me just pull something up because Enoch also uh, prophesied this and it's, this is in book, the beginning of the book of Enoch so so I'm just going to Jude real quick Starting in verse 14 of Jude, the brother of Jesus. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones, this is 144,000, to execute judgment upon all, and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And we, again, we back here in uh, Deuteronomy 33. The Yahuwah came from Sinai, the heavenly Sinai, and dawned on, dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. Indeed, he loves the people. All your holy ones are in your, are in your hand. And they followed in your steps. Everyone receives of your words. We need to receive of his words and follow in his steps. Moses charged us with a law and a possession. Mo Moses charged us with a law, a possession for the assembly of Jacob. And he was king, Moses was king in Jeshurun or Israel, when the heads of the people were gathered, the tribes of Israel together. And then it starts going through the, the blessings Moses gave to the 12 tribes, 12 uh, sons of Israel. And. So let's get back to Habakkuk chapter 3. God comes from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Again, this is when Jesus comes on the clouds with the 144,000. His splendor covers the heavens. His splendor covers the heavens. And the earth is full of His praise. Hallelujah. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand. And there is the hiding of his power. So some translations say he has horns in his, on his hand or horns coming from his hand. And let's see. And they actually both are, are accurate translations. He has rays flashing from his hand. And he has horns in his hand. Because, uh, well, the horn, 
the horn, first off, represents power or authority. And that's why it says, and there is the hiding of his power. Because the horn has seven horns in his hand. But it says, he has rays flashing forth from his hand. In another translation, or in other translations. Depending on, um, likely depending on what manuscript it was translated from. But, if we go to Revelation chapter 1, it says in verse 16, In his right hand he held seven stars. In his right hand he held seven stars. And we learn this is a, I, well I believe this is a, Oh, yes, well, right here, Revelation 1, verse 20, says, As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the lampstands are the churches. So, he, it says he has rays flashing forth from his hand. And right here we read that he has the, se the angels of the seven churches in his hand. Shining, flashing forth. But it also says, if we go back here to uh, Habakkuk 3, it says, His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays or horns in his hand or coming out of his hand. I don't have the... Uh, Yeah, I don't have the uh, other translations pulled up for this verse. But the word there for horn is, uh, I mean, it means horn. Uh, Karen. Horn. Horn, horns, might, strength, tusks. Hill horn. And again, horns represent power or authority. Well, one more thing about the horns. One second. Let me just read it one more time. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays or horns in his hand. And like I said, I don't have the other translation pulled up to see exactly what it says. And there is the hiding of his power. But one more thing about the horns before we continue. We read here. In Revelation 5, verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So, you know, it's crazy because it says the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. And so it's all tied in. It's all tied in together. The seven, seven eyes. The lamb having seven horns and seven eyes. Which are the seven spirits of God. And we read in another scripture. 
I don't have it here. That the lampstands, the seven spirits are the lampstands. Basically, the, oh, I don't, I don't want to misquote it, but basically the lamps, the lampstands contain the oil. It says the lampstands are the seven churches. It says he has, um, if we go back here, seven stars in his hand and seven lampstands. The lampstands are the, are the seven churches, but the oil, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits fill the lampstands. So, in Revelation 5 or 6, it says the Lamb has seven horns and the se seven spirits of God and seven eyes, which is the seven spirits of God. In other words, the it's saying the same thing, pretty much. The seven horns, the seven angels. I'm not... I don't want to, I'm not about to say that seven, the horns are the angels, but it's all, this is what we're reading about here in Habakkuk. Some translations say, um, he has, uh, rays flashing forth from his hand. And in Revelation 1, it says he has angels and the seven angels in his hand. Some other translations say he has horns in his hand. Here in Revelation 5 verse 6, it says he has seven horns. And both in Revelation in Revelation chapter 1, it said he also has the lamp, the seven lampstands, which contain the Holy Spirit. And here in Revelation 5 verse 6, it says he had, it mentions the seven spirits of God. So Revelation 1 20 and Revelation 5 6 are... Uh, Kind of saying the same thing, but I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Hopefully, hopefully that's not too confusing, and you see what I'm talking about. Uh, again, Revelation five or six, having seven horns and the seven spirits of God. And if we go here to. Revelation 1 verse 20, the seven stars, which are the seven angels, and then the lampstands, the seven churches, which are filled with the seven spirits of God. And back to Habakkuk. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays or horns in his hand. There is the hiding of his power. That's the sickle. And I'm going to have to uh, turn the car on. Hopefully it won't be too loud for, for you guys. And let me just do this for a second. So, uh, and there is the hiding of his power, because the horns represent power, and I'll just leave it at that. God comes from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. Before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. So if we pull up the other translations of this. Let 
the King James says, Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. The American Standard Version says, Before him went the pestilence, and fiery bolts went forth at his feet. The literal standard version says, Before him goes pestilence, and a burning flame goes forth at his feet. So before him goes pestilence, and after him, or as they translated, uh, is fire, burning coals, or so, something along those lines. And it just reminds me of this scripture over here in Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 3, which is speaking about the 144,000. And it says, Before them, Fire devours, behind them a flame blazes. And for him it says, before him a pestilence, behind him. Uh, as some of the translations say, a flame burns. And as we've been talking about, the 144,000 are going to be there with him when he comes on the clouds. So the 144,000 are caught up beforehand. And when Jesus comes, when he appears in the sky, the 144,000 are already going to be in the sky. And that is his arrows. That is his weapon that he's using to bring, bring judgment upon the world. And 144,000 are going to go out and carry out his judgment upon the world. And let me make sure... Yeah, I'm not sure if this is charging up. Just had to make sure that it normally vibrates when I plug it in, but it it didn't. Hopefully, it's charging. Before him goes pestilence and a plague or fire. Goes after him or at his feet. He stood and surveyed the earth. This is when he appears in the clouds. This is when the 144,000 are already in the sky. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And uh, this reminds me of another scripture. I can't remember what scripture it is exactly. He looked. What, what does it say? Uh, he looked at the earth and it trembled. Like that's <laughs> talking about God, the power of God. He looked at the earth and it trembled. And which, which in reality is probably speaking about all. Uh, probably a prophecy about the earthquake because when he comes on the clouds the earth trembles there's the earthquake he stood and surveyed the earth he looked and startled the nations yes the perpetual mountains were shattered and keep in mind mountains and hills re uh, represent nations or kingdoms he looked and startled the nations. Yes, the, perpet the perpetual mountains or kingdoms were shattered. The ancient hills or kingdoms collapsed. He's coming to bring judgment upon the kingdoms of this world. And if we go over here to... To Psalm chapter 110, starting in verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations 
He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He's coming to shatter kings and kingdoms. He's coming to shatter nations. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains or kingdoms were shattered. The ancient mountains or the ancient hills or kingdoms collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of Midian, tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. And as far as Midian and Cushan, there was a ca character of Cushan. Um, what's his name? You see right here in Cushan Rishathaim, here in Judges chapter 3. See, Judges chapter 3, God delivers uh, Israel from the king of Mesopotamia, king of Mesopotamia here, Cushan Rishathaim. And then in chapter 6, from Midian. And it mentions both Cushan and Midian. Um. And I'm just looking. And I'm not going to say, uh, I'm not going to say too much more about Cushan and, and Midian. I'm not sure. Uh, except one, one thing, uh, uh, Moses' wife. I guess I guess Zipporah was a Midianite, but said it was said she she was also from Cush. So that's interesting. I saw the tents of Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did Yahuwah rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? So Keep in mind, rivers also represent nations. Uh, water represents people. A lot of the time, the sea, depending on scripture, sometimes the sea represents the people of the world. The rivers can represent different nations. And just water in general represents people. And so, keep that in mind when we're reading what we're reading here because this is what it's talking about. And we're going to see in a minute. Here in a minute we're going to see the Gog Magog war here in Habakkuk chapter 3. Did Yahuwah rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses? On your chariots of salvation? And as we see again. When his wrath comes, that's when his salvation comes. Happens at the same time. He comes for judgment and also for salvation. And this is at the sixth seal. And it's not at the end of the tribulation. Like I said, from my understanding, it's uh, ten days in. Ten days into the tribulation. Because the Gog Magog War, that's at the beginning. And it says that from that war, from that battle, they're cleaning up the bodies for seven months. That's not going to be in a millennial reign. And that they're going to burn the weapons for seven years. That's not going to, I don't think it's going to be in a millennial reign. I believe that's the beginning of the final seven years. The beginning of the, uh, beginning of the tribulation 
or 10 days into the tribulation, technically. I'm not sure. I don't have it all figured out. But if it's seven years... It's not seven years and ten days. Well, basically... And I'll just, I'll just say this real quick before we continue. If you take ten days... Add it on to... Say, ten days at the beginning... And at the end of the ten days... You have the seven months of cleaning up the bodies. Seven 30-day months of cleaning up the bodies. That's 220 days. 220 days. You have 2,300 days left. After 200, 220 days, you have 2,300 days left. In, until everything is restored. The 200, 2,300 days mentioned in the book of Daniel... That there's going to be uh, sacrifices given over. The sacrifices are going to be to the Antichrist for 2,300 days until, or 2,300 evenings and mornings until, uh, which technically could be half that, but um, 2,300 evenings and mornings until everything is restored in the millennial reign, until Jesus comes back. To rain, and before the final, again before the final uh, twenty three hundred days, there's seven months plus ten days. I, I believe that's the ten days at the beginning, which is the ten days of captivity. That at the end of the ten days, we so we see in so many scriptures that Jesus. That when he comes on the clouds, he's he's coming to deliver his people out of out of captivity. And he comes on the clouds at the Gog Magog war. To the Bible says he, the whole earth will shake at his presence. He will be there. The whole the whole world will shake at his presence. That's when he comes on the clouds, and then from there, there's seven months. The ten day, the the captivity. The seven months, and then the twenty three hundred days left. This is my understanding on how it's going to play out. And within that ten days, the seals open. The first five seals open within that ten days, and the sixth at the end end of the ten days, uh, the persecution begins. Uh, like I said, the captivity begins. The persecution begins. That's when the antichrist is revealed. Uh, that's when the falling away happens. The apostasy. And uh, at the end of the 10 days, that's when he comes on the clouds. This is my understanding on it. Did Yahuwah rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses? On your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare. Your bow was made bare. Meaning he shot his arrows. And this is the arrows that we see in a lot of the scriptures. A lot of the prophecies. We see this in Psalm 18. He sent forth his arrows and scattered them. And lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. This is when he comes on the clouds. The arrows is the 144,000. They're going to be sent out to carry out his judgment. That's his weapon. The bow and arrow. And we go over here to... Zechariah chapter 9. I'm going to start here in verse 13. For I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim. And it's speaking about the 144,000, Judah and Ephraim, the whole house of Israel, both, both houses. And I will stir up your sons, O Zion, speaking about the 144,000, Against your sons, O Greece, speaking about the Western world and America more specifically, and I will make you like a warrior sword. God is the warrior. His sword or his 
bow and arrow is that's his weapon that's who's what he's using to carry out his judgment on the people for I will bend Judah as my bow I will fill the bow with Ephraim and I will stir up your sons O Zion again and I will stir up your sons O Zion against your sons O Greece and I will make you like a warrior sword then Yahuwah will appear over them over the 144,000 then Yahuwah will appear over them and his arrow will, and, and, and over top of all the people too and his arrow will go forth like lightning. That's when judgment begins. That's when the 144,000 go out to carry out judgment. And his arrow will go forth like lightning. And the Lord Yahuwah, the Lord God, will blow the trumpet. And that's when the that's the last trump, which is his voice. And will march in the storm winds of the south. Back here to... Uh, And just, I'll just say this real quick. This is when he makes himself known. Uh, Ezekiel 38 verse 18. It will come about on that day when God comes up against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God. Then my fury will mount up in my anger. So this is the wrath of God, which happens at the sixth seal. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. He's there. That's when he comes on the clouds. Here at the Gog Magog War. At the sixth seal. Back to Habakkuk. One more time from verse 8. Did Yahuwah raise, rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation, your bow was made bare. And pe people just keep creeping by, man. Creeping by watching me. Crazy. Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. The rods of chastisement. Or punishment were sworn, Selah. You cleaved the earth with rivers. And and I'm just looking this up real quick. Cleave to split or sever something, especially along a natural line or grain. You cleaved. Where are we at? Just lost my place. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The mountains as well, but the, the kingdoms saw you and quaked as we just read the whole earth one more time one more time here from Ezekiel 38 The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse and every wall will fall to the ground.
The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of waters swept by. The deep utters it, uttered its voice. It lifted high its hands, and this all, and speaking of all the nations, the mountains saw you and quaked. The downpours of waters, the downpour of waters swept by. The deep uttered its voice. The world, it lifted high its hands. The sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows. The arrows, that's 144,000. When the 144,000 are seen and their light is shining. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away. So, I mean, it appears the sun and moon are going to stop. Stood in their places. And there may, there may be a... Other, uh, other mentions of this I can't remember the sun and moon stood in their places they went away at the light of your arrows at the radiance of your gleaming spear his gleaming spear this is also speaking about the 144,000 they went away the sun and moon went away at the light of your arrows at the radiance of your gleaming spear his spear his the warrior sword the the bow and arrow, Ephraim and Judah, the 144,000. And we know that this is also going to happen at noon. It's going to happen. So this is when, so this just gives us another detail. It says, sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows. And we know the sun is going to be darkened at noon, according to some of the other scriptures. I believe noon Jerusalem time. So this is uh, going to be five in the morning. East Coast time. And when, when the 144,000, which are already caught up, which is, this is going to be, from my understanding, 10 days into the tribulation. When um, the 144,000 are going to be seen, it's going to get dark. The 144,000 are going to be seen. Uh, we, we know at the same time, the attacking arm, armies, the armies coming against Israel, are going to be coming against them at... Uh, at noon as well and then it's going to get dark the 144,000 are going to be seen they're going to attack Israel not the 144,000 but they're going to attack Israel at the same time from my understanding at the same time America is going to be attacked and destroyed but the 144,000 I believe are going to be I mean, they're God's weapon. As we see, God's weapon, his, uh, what God, who, who God is using to carry out his judgment upon the earth. And as we read in Zechariah 9, it said, one more time here, it says, I will, for I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim, and I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. And I mentioned this being in America because this goes back to um, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 being tied together, uh, basically overlaying prophecies. And in Daniel 7, the, the leopard is Greece. And where a lot of people screw up, people think uh, the leopard's Greece and the fourth fourth beast kingdom is Rome. But people miss out on the fact that it says the leopard has four heads. And this is the four heads of the leopard is Greece, Rome, Britain, and America. Four consecutive, successive uh, Western ruling empires. 
and America is the last one, and Greece, uh, in Daniel chapter 8, I believe that's more specifically about America, um, and you have to go to Daniel 8 to see what I'm talking about, but, uh, but it says here, and I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and like I've said, I believe Gog is also Pharaoh, also the king of Tyre, the king of Babylon, I believe is Donald Trump. And I believe the U.S. US troops are going to be involved. I believe that's Magog, or at least part of it, and are going to be involved in this attack on Israel. The Bible says the whole world comes against Jerusalem. And we read here, And I will stir up your sons, O Zion, the 144,000, against your sons, O Greece. Magog is what I believe is speaking about. Now, and so as, as I was saying, at noon, Jerusalem time, this is when the armies are going to begin to come against Israel. This is when it's going to get dark. And maybe they'll just continue in the dark. Um, this is when the 144,000 are going to be seen preparing for battle. And then Jesus comes out above them as we read. Um as we read in these scriptures he appears above them then his arrow the 144,000 goes out and carries out his judgment and defends Jerusalem from being destroyed defends the, the Jews from being destroyed I believe and also I, I don't know I don't know maybe maybe, uh, maybe it's just that maybe it's just just uh, for the Gog Magog war just attack uh, bringing down the armies of Gog and Magog or maybe it's for, for more We there's other scriptures that, that make it that make it seem like uh, they're going to be a part of 144,000 they're going to be a part of the, the rapture rapturing the people I'm not sure but there's definitely a scripture or two that leans in that direction as well Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows. So that's when it gets dark. That's when the sun is darkened at noon. They went away at the light of your arrows. That's when the 144,000 are seen. Which is the sign of the Son of Man. I believe the 144,000 based on the standard. Because the standard in the, in the prophecies is speaking about the 144,000. And the first place we see the standard in the Bible is when the Israelites were camping around side, outside of the uh, tabernacle. And there was one tribe on each side as, as the standard. And if you look at the populations, the number of people that was a part of the standard on each side uh, it forms a cross around, around the uh, tabernacle. And I believe the 144,000 are going to form a cross around the New Jerusalem. Uh, which is going to be seen in the sky. They're going to form a cross, and that's going to be the sign of the Son of Man. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation or wrath, you march through the earth. And we read in uh, Zechariah 9, you will march with the storm winds of the south. Or march in the storm winds of the south. Let me just go there again real quick. Then then Yahuwah, the, then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. And the Lord God will blow the trumpet and will march in the storm winds of the south.
In indignation, you marched through the earth. In anger, you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. So, his wrath and his salvation at the same time. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of, of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck, Selah. And the head of the house of evil, I believe this is speaking about Gog. The house of evil, this would be the, the, the beast kingdom, the leader of the beast kingdom. And this is referring to Satan. And actually, matter of fact, this same character, Gog, uh, king of Tyre, and uh, Ezekiel 28, is also referenced to Satan. King of Babylon and uh, Isaiah 14 is also referenced to Satan. The head of the house of evil. You struck the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Selah. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. Or uh, the footnote said warriors, the head of his warriors. So this is speaking about the Gog Magog war. This is speaking about this attack. Because this is when Jesus comes on the clouds. They stormed into... You pierced with his own spears the head of his warriors, the throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Gog Mega War, when Israel's attacked. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses, on the surge of many waters. You trampled on the sea, speaking about the people, with your horses. On the surge of many waters, and the U.S. is or Babylon is said to be on many waters. But on the surge of many waters, many nations, many people, are going to be coming against Israel in the Gog Magog War. You trampled on the sea with your horses, and as I said, the sea might represent can also represent the world. I believe uh, the people of the world, because that's the biggest body of water, the, the ocean. You trampled on the sea with your horses, on the surge of many waters. This is speaking about the attacking armies coming against Israel. And I'm going to just go back and read from verse 11 one more time. The sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed. Because this is when the rapture happens, but it's also when he defends Israel. You struck the head of the house of evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Selah. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. And also, you know, the captivity is going to be going on at the same time. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses, on the surge of many waters. Speaking about the nations coming against Israel. I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble. Habakkuk speaking. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress. For the people to arise who will invade us. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones. And in my place I tremble. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress. For the people to arise who will invade us. 
the same attack the Gog Magog war though the fig tree should not blossom and bring forth fruit and there be no fruit on the vines though the yield of the olive should fail fig tree and olive will represent Israel and the fig tree more specifically Judah it's modern day Israel Though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. And before I even continue, actually I'll just wait for this. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will exalt in Yahuwah. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, Yahuwah, is my strength. The Lord, Yahuwah, is my strength. And he has made my feet like hind's feet. And he makes me walk on my high places. For the choir director on my stringed instruments. And that's the end of Habakkuk. Pretty powerful chapter. If you haven't seen chapter 1 and chapter 2, go check them out. You can just go to bit.ly, bit.ly slash Larry Newport. And uh, just you can go to the playlist or you can go to the videos and scroll down. But uh, chapter 1 was about the Chaldeans. Chapter 2 was about the proud one. Gog. Donald Trump, I believe. I mean, I I definitely believe it's about him. Chapter 2. And after, let me just say this. Like I said, um, we know that he got a... Trump got rich by loans. And this is... uh, what is mentioned in Habakkuk chapter 2 and what I didn't look up I mean this is I mean this is so crazy because of uh, it's definitely speaking about him I I think it's definitely speaking about him in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 about this uh, this one character uh, who, who I believe is the main character besides maybe the Antichrist this guy has talked about Unless I have... I don't think he is the Antichrist. I think he's right before the Antichrist. I believe he's the head of the house of... The house of the... Who we read about earlier. I believe he's a leader. But I believe he will fall at the beginning of the day of the Lord and... The Antichrist will rise. This is my current understanding, but said he got rich by loans and it says won't your creditors uh won't basically won't they get tired of it and come after you and all i did was do a google search for trump loans afterward after i put out the video and look trump will have 900 million of his loans coming due in his second term Three hundred forty million. Trump has half a billion in loans coming due. Trump facing devastating debt load. Trump's bank loans appear to be in trouble. You know, you you just have to go out and go and check that video out. Uh, Habakkuk chapter two, the proud one. But uh, I believe with all my heart that's him, and I believe he is Gog. I believe he's his major character in the Bible. I don't think he's Antichrist.
but I believe his son-in-law is Kushner. But the beast, the beast is Nimrod. The beast is Apollyon, the angel of the abyss, the, the one that comes out of the bottomless pit when the fifth seal is open, or the fifth trumpet is blown. That's, uh, I believe, he, I believe he's actually coming out as a false prophet, coming out of the pit as a false prophet, telling the world to, to worship the one with the deadly head wound who dies and is resurrected. Who uh, I believe is going to be, who I believe is also Nimrod through cloning or genetic manipulation or something, and I believe it's Kushner. I believe it's Jared Kushner. But uh, again, that's the end of Habakkuk chapter 3. Uh, we learn something new each time. I, 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 learn, I learn some. I mean, we, we, we see the same picture throughout the scriptures. And. Again, we saw about the 144,000, the arrows, his gleaming spear, his, his weapon of war. It's 144,000. It's tied in directly with the Zechariah 9, Habakkuk 3 is, and with many scriptures. We saw Deuteronomy 33. We saw that this is what Enoch spoke about, coming with ten thousands of his holy ones. That's the 144,000. So... It all ties in together. It all ties in together. But uh, let's be ready, brothers and sisters. It's now, well, technically still May 14th here, but it's 10, 12 at night. So uh, it's uh, Shabbat now. It's the Sabbath. So Shabbat Shalom, Happy Sabbath to everybody out here celebrating the Sabbath. And we're going to see in the next Isaiah video, which I plan to do after this, a little bit more about the Sabbath and how God wants us these days to keep the Sabbath. And it's Isaiah 56, so keep a lookout for that, Lord willing. I'll do that here in a little bit. Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters, let's be obedient to God. It's, uh, he just wants us to rest. He wants us to rest and honor Him. Set the day apart to Him. And not just go and do whatever we want to do. And th this is the, the day that this is the day that the world has their free day and goes and does whatever they want to do. Has has fun. They don't rest. And as people of God, we're supposed to honor Him and be set apart, which is holy, to Him. And take the day off to rest this day while everybody else is running around doing stuff just take it easy Shabbat Shalom let's be obedient to God let's serve him with all our heart let's uh, be humble let's be fully humble let's uh, make sure we're right with him let's make sure we have a pure heart resist the devil and he will flee from you repent and believe the, and repent and believe the gospel. Anyone who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, repent and believe the gospel. There's not much time left. God just wants us to humble ourselves, turn, be willing to turn away from our old ways and just turn to Him. He wants us to humble ourselves, seek Him for salvation and forgiveness. He wants to save us, but He wants us to turn to Him for forgiveness and and be willing to turn away from our old life. And He helps us with that. He gives us the Holy Spirit, which changes us. He changes us. You don't have to change in order to turn to God. You turn to God and He changes you. You just got to be willing. Repent and believe the gospel. We'll give your life to Jesus Christ today. That's the end of Habakkuk. Uh, we still have one chapter left in Haggai. We already finished up Malachi. If you didn't see the, the last two chapters of Malachi, check that out. Malachi 3 and 4. I did did the two together. Um, still got to do the... We still got to do uh, the last chapter of Haggai. And then we have Jeremiah 46 through 52. 
um, Isaiah 56 through 66, and we're done with the prophets. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All glory to God. Praise His holy name. Thanks for tuning in. Love y'all. Shabbat shalom.